And I want to speak to us out of John 11 today. And just a bit of background is um, we've got a few characters and by the name of Martha, Mary, Lazarus, and um, the disciples, and Jesus. Now, Lazarus is a bit of a tongue twister. So if I fall over my own letters today, just work with me, right? But um, what happens is Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and Jesus are actually friends. They've got a relationship, and they've been hanging out, and, and, and the Bible actually says they are Jesus' friends. And so what happens is Lazarus gets sick, and Jesus is out ministering somewhere. And then they send word to Jesus saying, you better come, Jesus, because your friend, your friend Lazarus is sick. Will you come? And Jesus says to his disciples, well, we're not going to go yet. And this thing is not going to end in death, but uh, we'll go in a few days. And word comes that actually Lazarus has died. And the disciples are like, Jesus, now what? And he's like, okay, I think it's time for us to go now. And he says to them, look, Lazarus is sleeping, and it's time for me to go and wake him up. And they're like, oh, but if he's sick, he should sleep. You know? And they have this really random conversation. And then it gets to the point where Jesus actually says to them, he's dead, but it's good that he's dead because now I can do what I need to do so they can bring glory to God. And so what happens is Jesus goes back to Bethany after Lazarus had been dead um, four days. And so I want to pick up there. So now when they arrived in Bethany, this is John 11 from verse 17, which was only about two miles away from Jerusalem, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been dead and in the tomb for four days. Many friends of Mary and Martha had come from the region to console them over the loss of their brother. And when Martha had heard that Jesus was approaching the village, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that if you were to ask God for anything, he would do it for you. And Jesus looked at her and said, your brother will rise and live. And she replied, yes, I know, I know, Jesus. Everyone will rise, and everyone else on Resurrection Day will be alive. I know, Resurrection Day is coming and everything will be great. And he says, Martha, you don't have to wait until then. Isn't that the most beautiful thing ever? You don't have to wait until then. But he says, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Anyone who clings to me in faith, even though he dies, will live forever. And the one who lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? And Martha says, yes, Lord, you know I do. I've always believed that you are the anointed one, the son of God who has come into this world for us. Then she left and hurried off to her sister, Mary, and called her aside from all the mourners and whispered, he's here and he wants to see you. So when Mary heard this, she quickly went off to find him, for Jesus was lingering outside the village at the same spot where Martha had met him. Now Mary's friends who were comforting her noticed how quickly she ran out of the house. They followed her, assuming she was going to the tomb to mourn her brother. When Mary finally got to Jesus, she found him outside the village. She fell at his feet in tears. And she said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus looked at Mary and saw her weeping at his feet and all her friends who were with her grieving, he shuddered with emotion. He was deeply moved with tenderness and compassion. And he said to them, where did you bury them? Lord, come with us and we'll show you, they replied. And then the tears streamed down Jesus' face. Jesus, seeing Jesus weep, caused many of the mourners to say, look, look how much he loved Lazarus. Yet others said, isn't this the one who opens blind eyes? There's always going to be somebody with an accusation, with a pointing finger, finding fault. And then it says, why didn't he do something to keep Lazarus from dying? And then Jesus, with intense emotions, came to the tomb, a cave with a stone placed over it, and said, roll away the stone, Then Martha said, but Lord, he's been dead for four days. His body is already decomposing. And Jesus looks at her and says, didn't I tell you that if you would believe in me, you will see God unveil his power? And then Jesus calls Lazarus out from the tomb. There is so much in that story. But can we just for a second talk about, you know, sell by dates, best before dates and expiration dates? Because, you know, there's some of us who are sitting in this, in this place where you, who push those things to the, the limit, 
Did you know there's, there's a different thing about a sell by date, a best before date, and a use by date? Sell by dates are there for the, the businesses to sort of what looks good. It's not going to affect the product. It's not going to, you know, have a negative effect on you if you use the product. But it's just like, how much, how much can we get rid of before it starts looking a little bit worn and out of date? The best, best before date is an indicator of flavor and look, but you're still okay. You're still okay to sort of use it. Some people take no notice of it. Some people don't even know that these things exist on, on our foods. Any of those people that eat black bananas? You know, when you can smell a banana, it's already passed its use by date, right? But I do have friends who would not eat it until you could smell it, until it's ready for banana bread, banana cake, right? Some people know what that is. It is, there's a certain way you've got to use it. Do you love it like that? No. But then there's something called a use by date, an expiration date, and this is actually the strongest indicator of food safety. And that's the one we need to pay attention to. But even in those things, there are some people I know that have pushed that boundary. How many of us are sitting at a place where we think our miracles have already exceeded their use-by date or their expiration date? Because you see, Martha and Mary were trusting God to do a miracle in their brother's life, but then he died. And so, so many us, of, of us could be sitting in the exact same place where we, we look at the thing that we've been trusting for, the thing that we've been waiting for, the thing that we need an answer to, and it just hasn't come, and we feel that it's almost died in us, and so we're like, okay, well, it must be over. And so we approach Jesus the exact same way that Martha does. Lord, if you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. Lord, if you had answered my prayer back then, then this wouldn't have happened. Lord, why did I have to go through this when you could have stopped me from going through this before I had to go through this? And these are all the questions we have. And I want to say to you today is that there is no expiration, use by date or sell by date on the things that you are trusting God for. Because he is not a God that is late. He is not a God that doesn't know what he's doing. And he's not a God that's taken his hands off of you. And he will use every single thing to bring glory back to his name and restoration in those areas, either to protect you or to bring full healing and wholeness. But I just want to speak to us about some of these characters and just unpack them for a while. Is that okay? And so Martha, if you, if you study this character in the Bible, Martha is known to be a bit of a, a, a busy person, not a busy body, just a busy, need to do something. What else can I do? I need to be doing this. I need to be doing that. I need to be doing this. And so in different passages, there was even an account where she's sitting with Jesus and Mary and the disciples, and she's busy doing and serving, and she's in and out of the rooms, and she's making everything great, and she's being hospitable, and she's doing everything she can. And she realizes that Mary, her sister, is sitting doing nothing. So she doesn't go to Mary. She goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, do something about this. She basically tittletales on her sister. She's like, surely she needs to get up and help. And Jesus says to her, Martha, don't you see that I'm only going to be here for a short while? Just, just be with me. And so she's known for in being busy in, in her ways and doing things and running around. And so here we have Martha who approaches Jesus. But I want us to sort of in parallel look at these stories. Is, is that okay? If we, if we had a, a board in, in, in parallel, we've got Martha's response and Jesus, how he responds to her, and Mary and how she approaches Jesus and his response to her. And I want to put them up side by side just for a moment. Martha comes up to Jesus and says, my Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Mary says the exact same thing. My Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Yet Jesus responds to them completely differently. And it got me thinking, and it got my attention when I started studying this piece of scripture, and I was like, God, what, what's the difference? Because they're both saying the same thing. They both had the same relationship with you. They both lost a brother, and you know, but there was some difference in their response. And so I want to look at that for a second. Martha comes and says, God, if you had been here, Jesus, my brother wouldn't have died. But notice what she does straight away. But I know. I know that if you ask God anything, he will do it for you. And so immediately she goes into the, I know that you could do it, but you know what? What are you going to do about it now? What can you do about it now, Jesus? What are you going to do to fix it? And Jesus' response to her is, Martha, let me just tell you, your brother is not going to die. He's going to live. He will rise and he will live. And then he says to her, 
would you believe it, Martha? I, I'm the resurrection. I'm the life. Would you, do you believe it? And she goes, I do, Jesus. You know I do. But what he asks her and how she answers it, do not touch base. He asks her a very specific question saying, do you believe it, Martha, that I am the resurrection? I am the light. You don't actually have to wait. And so Martha answers it in a very, very real, honest, yeah, yeah, everyone's going to rise on resurrection day. There are some of us sitting in this place where we've resigned ourselves to an unanswered prayer or an unanswered desire because we know that in the end when Jesus comes back, it will all be perfect. But his word to you today is you don't have to wait until then. He's got an answer for you today. It might have looked like the expiration date on what they needed was done, was over. You've missed the point. You didn't move when you should have. You, sh you didn't have the conversation when you could have. You didn't do what you, what you feel God did. He didn't pitch up when you thought he should have pitched up. And so what happens is we resign ourselves saying, well, you know, one day it will all work out. And Jesus wants to say to you, no, no, like you don't have to wait until then. You can, you can still approach me. You can still trust me for the thing that you think has, has moved past me actually stepping into that place. See, Martha came and wanted him to do something about it. And Jesus says, I, I will, Martha, but when do you expect me to do this? Martha, where's your heart in this? Because he doesn't just say to her, look, you know, like, you don't have to wait. He goes, I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm going to still be resurrected. You know, I'm still going to do all these things. I am the resurrection and the life right now. You know, sometimes we approach Jesus with the, yeah, one day, someday, and he goes, no, today. One day, Jesus, when you will. Someday when we get to that point, he goes, what about today? What about if today you keep on asking me and you keep on trusting me and you keep aligning yourself with what I want? And so straight away, he totally speaks into that place. You see, the thing is, Martha knows Jesus. She knows him. They've called friends. And if you've hung out with Jesus, you'll know that he's, he's a miracle-working God. And so she approaches him because she knows she can. And she also knows that she can get something from him. So what she's doing is not wrong. And so she gets to that place. And he's like, but you know what, Martha? There's so much more to this. Can we just move past all these other things that you're asking me and that you're saying to me? But can we dig a little bit deeper? He goes, do you believe it, Martha? Would you believe me? Would you believe me when I say you don't have to wait? Would you believe me when I say your miracle is still there? Would you believe me when I say I am present right now, in your today, in your now, in the moment that you need me, right now, you don't have to wait? See, the thing is, if we've been asking these questions in regards to the things we're facing, what would your answer be? Do you believe God? When he says, you know what, you'll be healed. Yes, I know, Jesus. When we're all resurrected, we're in heaven. There'll be no sickness and no heartache and no brokenness. I do believe that. But it's been removed from your present tense. What would your answer be? How would you answer that when Jesus says, you don't have to wait until then? When you're trusting for your breakthrough and you're saying, I know, I just need to get a few more things in line. And when I finally get my head around this and when I finally understand it and when I finally position myself in a certain way, then it will come. And he's going, but what, what if it could come today like you don't have to wait? Do you believe me that I am? I am the resurrection and the life in your moment right now. See, the thing is, Martha is making a confession. And she's saying a formal statement of admission. When Jesus says, what is it that you believe? She's like, do you believe this? And she says, I do. I believe that you're the son of God. I believe that you've come for us. And that's the broader picture of who Jesus is. He's a savior sent to the world to save us, right? And so she makes this confession, and she confesses with her mouth that she does believe. But then there's also a conviction, a conviction which is a firmly held belief, a certainty and assurance. And I feel as if Martha slightly has a disconnect between those two. She's confessing it. But when it comes down to stand on the, what she really, really believes, there's a bit of a, I'm not too sure right now. I know you are good, but will you be good to me? I know you can heal, but will you heal me? And there's that scripture in the Bible where it says God is willing and he's able, but you're like, I know you can, but will you? Because sometimes you don't, Jesus. 
And so what happens is our confessions have to be girded and underpinned and, and rooted and established on our firm conviction because otherwise a confession is just what we say to make it feel as if we, we do know it, but there's, it, it leaves us hanging. It leaves us questioning. It leaves us a little bit unstable when it comes down to the matter of like, you don't have to wait. Would you believe me? What is our truest conviction? Because even though Martha is asking him, she's like, Jesus, I know that you can still ask your God to do something. I know you can still. And then it comes time, jump a few pre- pre- um, verses forward, when he says, roll away the stone, she goes, but, but Jesus, he stinks. He's decomposed. The very thing she's actually asked him for is the very thing she steps away from. She's like, I don't know. I don't know about this. Our confessions have to be firmly established on a conviction that is unmovable. In, in, in impenetrable of who Jesus is. See, the thing is, when we allow, when we get caught up purely on what Jesus does, when he doesn't do those things, we stand the, illusion, the, the risk of being disillusioned. When we purely approach him saying, God, will you do this because I believe you can? And then he does it, our faith is affirmed. But when he doesn't, our faith is shaken. Because we are totally absorbed with what he's doing and what he's not doing. And Jesus is saying to us, guys, I need you to move beyond that. Because what I do is not who I am. Who I am is what I do. Our convictions give us substance to our confession. Jesus doesn't get behind our problems or our issues. Our problems, issues and situations have to get behind him. Martha came to get. Jesus wants us to be more. Jesus wants to be more to us than just what he does. Where Mary came to be. How do I know this? Mary has a, has a reputation for choosing to just be with Jesus. That day when she had the opportunity to sit around the table with him, she just sat. She chose to be. This Mary is the same Mary that would then come to Jesus and pour out her expensive perfume and wipe his feet with her with her head just to be with him and so when Mary approaches Jesus that day she comes running and says the exact same thing but a completely different approach a completely different uh, posture a completely different just uh, revelation of who Jesus was and so she runs to Jesus and says Jesus if you had been here my brother wouldn't have died but she comes and she falls at his feet weeping in, in this humility and in a posture of worship. And I wonder if her words were, Jesus, if you, if you had been here, just you, Jesus. She doesn't ask him anything more. She doesn't say, but I know you can still raise him from the dead. She just stops right there at his feet in worship, in submission, heartbroken, completely just torn apart, but she stops and says, if you had been here, Jesus. And you know, there's a song that I want to read the lyrics, but before I get there, I just want to show you Jesus' response. He looks at her weeping, and he breaks down. He looks at her posture, and he he sees her wrapped up in who he is. Jesus, you, here, me, that's basically what I feel she's doing. She's just, she stops right there. She's like, if it was you, if you were here, Jesus, the situation in you. And he looks at her and it says he's overcome with emotion. He shudders, tears pouring down his face. And he says nothing to her. He doesn't say to her, Mary, your, your brother's going to rise. Because right now, actually, That's not what she needs to hear. She knows. Right now, she's in a place where she's like, you know what, you're here now. You're here now, and and I'm here now. And so he doesn't, but what he does do is the very thing he told Mary, Martha, he was going to do. And he says, where is he? Where is the tomb? And he goes on to raise him from the dead. See, the thing is, as Mary sits there, he doesn't question her. 
and he doesn't ask her any, uh, just say anything to her. It's just him and her and everything laid bare before him. She's not hiding her emotions. She's not hiding her grief. She's not saying it didn't matter because he's there now. She just allowed him to be in that moment with her. And in the silence of that moment, Jesus moves. In that silence, in that surrender, in that humility, he moves on her behalf. Her miracle comes from a different place. Her miracle didn't come from the fact that she knew God could do stuff. She knew who he was. And there's this song that I've had on repeat for a few weeks, and I want to just read it to you for a second. And, and I th- the, the singer's name is Natalie Grant, and she sings this song, and she says, you know, when life is overwhelmed, and I know that just with a second you can wave your hand and everything can be okay, and, and, and she's basically saying, you know, you've, everything that's happening in the story, and that gets to the, the part where she says, but you know what, Jesus, help me want the healer more than the healing. Help me want the giver more than the giving. Help me want the savior more than the saving. Help me want you, Jesus, more than anything. And if, if there was a song that would, or, or words that would totally wrap up these things, I feel that that song puts it in perfectly. When we approach Jesus and we say, God, what can you do about the situation? Because the thing is, he allows us to approach him like that because he is the God who gives. But he actually wants us to move beyond that, going, you know what? It's not just about what I'm giving because there is an end to just the the end product. He's like, but I need you to come a little bit deeper. I need you to come into everything that I am. He wants us to be found in him at his feet and allowing him to be who he is. Not do what he does. He's like, let me be. Let me not just give you peace. Let me be your peace. Let me not just heal you. Let, me f- let you be whole in me. Let me not just give you an, a good day. Let you find life in me. And he wants to move us beyond his hand to his heart. See, I believe that we can actually relate to Martha on more than one level. I also heard it said once, is that it's one thing to know what Jesus said. Because we can quote scriptures, you know? You can learn a scripture and you can throw it in people's faces and you can, you know, pin yourself up with it. And scriptures are a good thing to know and memorize. But one thing that we really also need to know is how Jesus said it. We need to understand how he would have said something to somebody. And, you know, you could read a passage of scripture and see an accusation, a judgment, and a finger pointing Jesus. Or you can read the same scripture and see a a heart that bleeds for you, a hand that comes around, and an extended hand that will lift you up from that. Because his entire purpose on life was bringing and closing the gap and bringing reconciliation to us. Every single thing he did, whether it is correction or whether it is comfort, it is to bring us into, into perfect relationship with who he is. And so Martha might have approached from a position of, what are you doing about us, Jesus? What are you going to do? And she approaches him with all this external appearance of bravery, strength, you know, authority. Like, I know that if you do something, and she's, she's approaching him with every bit of strength in her heart. But you know what? Is that Jesus is so kind that he's not harsh or dismissive with her. Because you can read that scripture and you can see Jesus say to her, Martha, okay. That's enough. Don't speak to me like that. Your brother's going to live. But I honestly don't believe that he said it like that. I honestly believe that he said, Martha, I can see how you've come to me. You've come to me all strong. You've come to me trying to keep it together. You've come to me confused and disillusioned, but you're kind of trying to work yourself through it. He says, but then what he does is in his kindness and his compassion, Jesus straight away doesn't dismiss her and speak correction. He speaks to her fear. He speaks to her disappointment. He speaks to her massive question of like, why didn't you do something, Jesus? I asked you, but you didn't do it. I called for you, but you didn't come. And now he's dead. You are too late. I had to experience this, and now I don't know if I can get back up again, but I know that you can still do anything because that's who you say you are. But does she believe that's who he is in her situation? And so what happens is, in her bravery and strength, Jesus speaks to her doubts, her fears, and her very real reality. He doesn't let her move on and going, just come with me, I'll show you what I'm going to do. Immediately he says, Martha, come. Come. You're waiting for me to do something, but I actually need you to know who I am. 
You're waiting for me to make this right, but I actually need you to be found whole in who I am. And so what he does is that he approaches her in a way that her entire struggle, she approaches him, is exposed. She's defensive, maybe. Maybe she's even a little bit, with a bit of a slight accusation, you didn't come, but I needed you to come. But Jesus speaks the truth into the very thing that caused her to respond like that. You know, we could learn from this, Jesus. When people approach us, and sometimes defensively even so, because sometimes it's hard to, you know, you, you work yourself up to say something, and so you just put it all out there. And, you know, Jesus wasn't, he wasn't overwhelmed by her, her response. He wasn't even caught of God. He's like, Mary, I, I, Martha, I know what's going on below that. I know what's going on deeper. And so he receives her the way she comes, but he doesn't leave her that way. He sees your crushed heart and the question marks in your, in your life. He sees them. And he's not intimidated by them, guys. He sees the confusion and the hurt. He sees that those are the very things that could actually just wedge them, themselves in between the, who you know he could be and who you know he is. And so what he does is he speaks into those areas. So the very thing that could cause her to step back, be disillusioned, be offended, be hurt, remove who he is, and replace it with her situation of what happened, he speaks to those things. And he says, Mary, you don't, Martha, you don't have to wait. I am the resurrection and the life. He's not going to die. And he immediately gives her the outcome. He immediately speaks the good news into her situation. He immediately says to her, Martha, you're coming to me and you're accusing me, but let me just tell you, it's going to be okay. And you know, I feel like God wants to say that to us today. You don't have to necessarily come here with having just buried your brother, but there are other things that you've buried and where you feel God didn't pitch up and he hasn't answered you or whatever. And I feel like God's saying, I don't want those things to sway you in your faith, and so I want to tell you straight up, come. Come. Because Jesus says to Martha, in very real day, he was, like he would say to you, it's okay, Martha. I promise you it's okay. I'm here now. Martha, it will be okay. Whatever it is, Myra, Darren, Brendan, Jared, Lou, He'll step into your situation today and he wants to say, it's okay, I'm here now. It will be okay. And his next question is, but will you let me in? Will you let me in to that thing? That thing that might have caused you to step back a little bit. That thing where you're waiting for me to do something and he's going, I want to be more than that in your life. And so as the worship team come up, I actually, want to, I actually want to play that song for us. Is that okay? Can we do that? And we're going to end with this. Jesus is, is here now. He's not a someday, one day. He's a very today in your life right now. And he wants to ask you the question. He wants to first tell you it's okay. I'm here now. But will you let me into those things? Will you? And maybe today you find yourself in a place where you're like, you know what, I just, I just need to be. I just need to be. Because when I be, everything else is taken care of, which is exactly what Mary teaches us in this passage. She just came. And we're going to play that song, You Can Start It So Long. And I just want you to listen to the words and allow it to wash over you. Allow it to, to just, just underpin and reassure you and just establish a few things and have a conversation with Jesus. Can you start it from the beginning, please? I won't talk now, so you can hear the words.
that beautiful? I just want to pray that over you today. If you've come in here today and you're, you're sitting in that place where you're waiting for your breakthrough, I want to encourage you that it's, it's there. It's waiting for you. You don't have to wait until the resurrection. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Today, it's all done. And I want to pray over us today, just as we finish this, is that there is, there is a way to approach him. And he knows. He responds to us. He's not intimidated. He's not fearful. He knows who he is. But he wants to be more to us than what he does. And so even as we're heading up to Easter, and, and I don't know how you've come in here today, but today is, is preparation for what he wants to do. You know, we're, we're on the move with God. If you find yourself here today, you're not excluded from what God has been doing in this church because I believe he's doing it in the nations. He's like, guys, we, we need to keep moving forward. We need to keep pressing on. We need to be taking ground. We need to be taking back what's been stolen. We need to be setting up, you know, establishing truth and life and being pillars of, of strength for people. We need to keep moving forward. And so today, I want to say, like, Jesus' response is there for you. But you know, the safest place is when we just allow him to be when we be with him. And so I'm going to pray over you today. If you've got any prayer requests, we're going to pray in a second. And we've got some prayer people that would like to pray with you because we trust in God for breakthrough. We trust in God in this church. Like Joel mentioned before the time, we've seen miracles. We've seen signs. We've seen wonders. We've seen God do things, move mountains. When everything was against us, he still made a way. And I don't know what you're battling with today, but I want to stand in agreement that as you approach the healer, you would find healing. And as you approach the giver, you will find your provision. As you approach the savior, you would be saved from whatever it is. As you approach Jesus, you would find everything. And so, Father, I just thank you for the absolute privilege of being called by your name, known to you. But, Father, I thank you that today, whether we find ourselves in a position of Martha or Mary, Father God, you are the same Jesus, and you have the same power and the same promises to us. Father, I pray that you would bring such healing and wholeness today in this place. God, just, we, we extend our faith. You might not know what's happening in the person's life next to you or what, what the turmoil is or what the confusion is, what the questions are, what the fears are. But Father, I thank you that as a body of Jesus Christ, as we come alongside each other, we just pray over every single person here today. Father, and I thank you that you would speak to us, Father. You would, be, you would move on our behalf. You would do things that only you could do, Father God. And in that, Father, we would move from a place of receiving to just being in you. And so, Father, I pray blessings over every person. I pray that this week there would be breakthroughs. God, things that we've been praying over, God, where people are, are moving into the more that you have for them, Father, that there's already provision waiting in that place. Father God, people that are, are, are starting out afresh, Father God, that there's already equipping for the next season. People who are carrying dreams and desires or questions, Father, there is clarity. There is just um, people coming alongside and positioning them to, to push them into the next thing, Father God, because in you there is no holding back, but there is life, there is freedom, there is more there is everything we need and so father god i thank you that we could be found at your feet or we could be bring brought into that place but father you embrace those situations today father and so father psalm 91 says that if we abide in you we would find shelter under the shadow and so father god i thank you that today that we would move into that place that we are covered by your your protection your wings and you sing songs over us. And so, Father God, I commit each and every person to you this week. And we say, have your way in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. amen.